The Libertas Media Project rolls on, and welcome to it. As you know, we tend to focus, like the proverbial laser beam, on current events and their impact on freedom and liberty, not so much pop culture and book reviews. So to borrow a phrase from Monty Python, now for something completely different. For the first time in some years, actually, I recently had the opportunity to read a work of fiction. No, not the latest BLS report. Now, this is a, a novel titled Justifiable Homicide. And here's the Amazon thumbnail. When does the killing of political leaders become morally justifiable? Killing the Hitler, Stalins, and Pol Potts of the world is easy to justify. Murderous tyrants need to be killed. But what if our leaders are merely idiots? Or perhaps corrupt petty tyrants who aren't in the same league as Hitler, Stalin, or Pol Pot? How much damage can we allow them to do? How many of our rights can we allow them to take away before killing them becomes justifiable homicide? Now, if you've given any serious thought to the state of affairs in our country today, some of these questions may have actually crossed your mind. To have them posed in a work of fiction and exploring the possibilities was, well, at least for me, too provocative to resist, especially in light of the follow-up question that's unavoidable what if? So that's what we're going to be talking about with the author and a damn prolific one at that, Robert W. McGee. Robert, welcome. Thanks for joining us this morning. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, let me. Oh, let me just add uh, for a moment here before we begin. Mr. McGee's resume is as impressive as it is long, with degrees and doctorates and other milestone accomplishments to his credit. So much so that it would take up way too much of our limited time to run through it here. Nevertheless, you can follow the links that you've seen on our website and be impressed yourself. So uh, let's take a look at Justifiable Homicide, uh, the book and the concept, in the context of the conditions and the parameters that I just mentioned, Robert. As a, as a student of the passing societal parade here in America, where would you peg the odds of something like the plot line actually happening here? Well, a lot of people have asked me that. Well, not a lot, but a few. But all the components are there. Basically, it's about a group of patriots uh, in Miami who think that the government has crossed the line and it's time for blowback. And they start compiling a list of people they think are destroying the fabric of America, and they start going through the list, killing them. But uh, they disagree among themselves as to who should be on the list. Some people think that uh, mere advocacy of socialism and fascism is enough to get them bumped off. And other people say that they should uh, actually commit an overt act first before they should be put on the list. And they squabble among themselves. So there, there's a number of conflicts going on between the patriots and the, uh, I guess you could call them, the, well, I call them cockroaches, actually. They're, you know, if you look at what cockroaches or termites, I mean, termites, you know, they eat away gradually at the, the foundation of a wooden house. And they, if the United States is like a wooden house, they're eating away gradually at the, the foundation. And over a matter of time, they're going to destroy it unless they're destroyed first. And so uh, there, there are several conflicts going on there. And I... Uh, I have some sort of current event things in there about you know what the politicians in Washington and other places are doing, and um, so I, I I try to make it a current kind of thing. But unfortunately, I think this is going to have a long shelf life because it's going on and on, and you know, every week is something new and different. But it's it's all really the same. It's like Washington versus the people, pretty much. And uh, these patriots, some of them are conservative, some are libertarian. And so that's part of the conflict, too, that they disagree on certain things. And so there's that conflict going on, plus the uh, the socialists in Washington who would take away our rights a little bit at a time or in one fell sweep, swoop that they could get away with it. So it's, it, it took 129,000 words before I decided it was time to end it. And that's about a novel and a half. Well, your analogy of termites is uh, is certainly apt in that you know one termite in the basement isn't going to get anybody's attention, but the uh, a swarm over a period of time uh, causes serious damage, which is similar to the old saw that 
like rust, incrementalism never sleeps, and we tend not to be terribly aware of of what goes on on a day-to-day basis, like your reverence to eminent domain and the Supreme Court decision there and so on. And as heinous as that was, especially after the decision and how it all turned out up there, he makes it kind of compounds the felony. But uh, in that regard, do you think incrementalism leads to the apathy that we see among so many of our fellow citizens? I think that's a contributing factor. I, you know, whenever I, I uh, watch the news or read things on the internet, I oh boy, here's another one, you know. And after a while, you just get disgusted with it. You want to throw up your hands and walk away from it. But uh, but some people have to fight back, and uh, the patriots in my novel are among that that small minority, and they've been trained too. They're in the prior life, they were in the military, and they learned how to kill people. And they, they've kept their patriotism. Again, some are conservatives, some are libertarians, so they have a different view of patriotism a little bit. But their goal is the same. It's to kill the termites before they can destroy America. Well, let me ask you from a uh, technical perspective. Isn't the deck seriously stacked against pulling off something like what you set out in the book? I mean, does the FBI and other government agencies, even on a local level, uh, not necessarily federal, uh, have all of the technical toys they need to make short work of anyone or any such group so inclined? Well, they do, uh, especially these days. I mean, during the first American Revolution, uh, they didn't have the Internet, they didn't have drones, they didn't have all this spy stuff where you could read emails because they didn't have emails. So I think it would be easier for the government to identify the, the potential enemy than ever before. I mean, you just look on uh, Facebook and see who's making anti-government comments. I'm sure they have lists. You know, they might even have it prioritized about who to go after first. But, you know, just because they have the overwhelming advantage doesn't mean that they could win ultimately. I mean, look at Vietnam. We, we, we had all the weaponry, pretty much, but we still lost because it was an insurgency kind of thing. And the same thing with the first American Revolution. The, the British had all the troops and all that. They had all the wealth. All we had was people who were willing to die for a cause. And it was on our home turf, too, which gave us somewhat of an advantage. So even though it looks hopeless, if you look at the statistics, um, in the long term, if we do have a second American Revolution, uh, I think the good guys could win, and by good guys, I mean the people who want freedom and the Constitution and so forth. Right. Although there are some flaws with the Constitution, but it's a pretty good Constitution. As constitutions go, yes. Well, that brings me back as a follow-up on the apathy question. Uh, the, uh, for example, Americans are noted for their generosity. Uh, they, I mean, they'll give until it hurts for anybody in need when there's a tsunami on the other side of the world or a mudslide or an earthquake or a hurricane or whatever. I mean, uh, Americans are inv- invariably the, the first ones out there uh, with uh, food and whatever else is, is necessary. But then you turn in the other direction and you see Randy Weaver and Ruby Ridge, and the uh, the murder of his wife and son, and the incineration of a whole bunch of men, women, and children at Waco, and these all pretty much got a national shrug. What about that? Yeah, I, I was sort of disappointed that uh, the federal agents who killed those people uh, weren't brought to justice. There were a few trials, I guess, and they were found not guilty, and some people weren't even brought to trial. And uh, some people know the addresses of those people, too, and nobody went after them. You know, the, the patriots in my novel, they, they know where they work, they know where they live, and they go after them. But in, in the real world, like uh, Ruby Ridge and Waco, and, and that, nobody's really going after them. Well, with the exception of Timothy McVeigh. From what I read, uh, there was a journalist that interviewed him in prison, and he said the reason he went to Oklahoma City was because that's where the headquarters were for the the people who did Ruby Ridge and Waco. That, that was the reason behind it, at least according to the, the journalist who interviewed him. And he just wanted to blow up the whole building. And I, I could understand that because, you know, if they got away with murder, literally killing women and children, incinerating them, and shooting an unarmed wife in the head while she was holding her child, I and mean, those people have to be brought to justice. And if the justice system doesn't do it, then maybe it's time for a little vigilante justice. At least that was the Timothy McVeigh. Uh, view of it. And then afterwards, when uh, the journalist interviewed him and he said, what about killing all those children? He said, well, if I 
knew that there was a daycare center in the building, maybe he wouldn't have blown it up. Maybe he would have resorted to targeted assassinations instead. In fact, that, that's what I do in the novel. I don't. They even had that discussion that they should uh, kill not only the perpetrator, the Fed, whoever it happens to be, but also the Fed's family to send a message. Because they do that, the Russian mafia will come after not only you, but also your family kind of thing. You know, but that sends a bad message, because if you're a patriot, you don't go around uh, maximizing collateral damage. You know, it should be targeted rather than just blowing up buildings with a lot of innocent people in it. So uh, my novel goes into that, too, and it presents both sides. And uh, I do that a lot. I uh, I give several alternative arguments, and they argue it out one way or the other, and then they make a decision, or sometimes they don't make a decision, and they have their own separate lists that have different people on them. And <laughs> I think it's an exciting read, but maybe I'm biased. No, I uh, <clears throat> I, I found it very compelling and moved right along. I I think um, I think it took me uh, you know just parts of of a weekend of inclement weather to uh, to get through it. It's not because I had time on my hands, but because it's a page turner. I mean, it's a it's right up there with Nelson DeMille or Robert Ludlum or Tom Clancy or any of these other guys who I've either read or had the pleasure of knowing over the years. With respects to the subjects, uh, as I mentioned, that are addressed in Justifiable Homicide, they're, they're pretty edgy. National security, giving aid and comfort to the enemy, are used as probable cause for violating the constitutionally protected rights of of a lot of the victims. People have gotten into trouble with the law just for talking about things like this. All the stories about the NSA and wiretaps and eavesdropping and emails and all the rest. The First Amendment notwithstanding, since writing the book, have you been contacted by any federal or local agencies questioning your motives or planting seeds like this among the uh, the downtrodden? <laughs> is that uh, is uh, any knocks on the door? Uh, not yet, but I'm expecting it. I mean, I've read things on the internet where the the FBI visits people because they uh, they take photographs of people at Tea Party rallies and then they identify them through uh, facial recognition. And then they come to visit them and they ask them questions like, "Are you a terrorist?" You know, who would answer that question? You know, if you are a terrorist, you'd say no, and if you're not a terrorist, you'd say no. What kind of answer are they expecting? You know. And, uh, I'm probably on their radar. If I'm not, they're asleep at the switch. And uh, Some people have asked me if the novel is uh, a sort of call to arms and a manual about how to do it. And uh, it wasn't really my intent, but you could use it that way if you want. Well, what think, about that? Has has there been any contact uh, that you would care to mention uh, from individuals, uh, someone who would see you as their fearless leader for carrying the idea forward or... Uh, anything that would suggest that you know a seed or seeds might be taking root in various parts of the country as a result of reading the book? Uh, no one has really contacted me in, in that regard. You know, I'm I'm not a leader. I don't like to be a leader, and I don't like to be a follower either. I just you know, like some people think there's only two categories of people: leaders and followers. But I, I'd rather not be either one. I'd rather just be autonomous. And I think individual feel fixed in there somewhere. Yeah, an individual. Yeah, I don't like the idea of leaders, actually, except in certain situations. You know, like if you have to do something and you need coordination, it's good to have a leader who will sort of uh, break down the path for you and make it easier. Uh, I'm not a big worshiper of, worshiper of leaders. Look at some of the ones we have now, you know, not only in Washington, but the, the local and state people, too. They're out of control, and I don't want to follow them. Yeah. And I don't want anybody else to follow them either. Well, don't you think that uh, when we think of leaders, we think of people who are subsequently imbued with some measure of power or authority by virtue of that leadership position? And, you know, Lord Acton instructed us pretty accurately is what happens to individuals who get caught up in the power of their position and the corruption that naturally follows. So being a leader, at the very least, is going to open you to the susceptibility of becoming corrupt. Yeah, I've observed that even in high school, people who are running for class president, you know, they, they get corrupted even before they get elected. I mean, just think if you gave them a, a ticket to Washington with a free reign pretty much, which is what President Obama has. You know, he has a phone and he has a pen and he's using them and Congress isn't doing anything to put the brakes on that. Yeah, and when you add to that, he's got the 
the unfathomable wealth of other people's money to spend with impunity. So Yeah, it's always nice if you have more than just your own resources. If you can use <laughs> taxpayer resources to do what you want, that's great. But one of the things that comes up every once in a while, I discuss this with Judge Napolitano from time to time, and that is the state of the rule of law. Cited on a Facebook post under licensing liberty, it cites the Murdoch v. Pennsylvania case that involved the Jehovah's Witnesses and um, licensing their proselytizing efforts. And the uh, and Shuttlesworth v. Birmingham, the Murdoch case, part of the uh, decision read, no state shall convert a liberty into a license and charge a fee, therefore. And in the Birmingham case, if the state converts a right, parens liberty, into a privilege, the citizen can ignore the license and fee and engage in the right with impunity. The question is, if we are a nation of laws, not a nation of men, and if the rule of law is the cornerstone for the republic, uh, how is it for the average citizen to read something that, hey, this is a Supreme Court decision, so I'm going to go ahead and carry my gun concealed without a permit. I'm going to do all these things that are licensed and regulated and so on with, with the impunity that is suggested in the decision. How, from a legal and pragmatic standpoint, does that fly? Well, it doesn't, unfortunately, because uh, the courts seem to think that the Constitution is void where prohibited by law. And, uh, you know, they think that uh, there should be all these exceptions. And uh, I ran into a case like that when I when I had new faculty orientation at the university I'm at now. The, the chief of police came in and gave a lecture about not having guns on campus. And I asked him a question like, why are you violating our right to keep and bear arms? And he was just shocked that a faculty member would even ask that, especially since they're all lefties and Marxists, you know, except me. And uh, he said, well, if there are, you know, uh, it's not an absolute thing. The First Amendment's not absolute. Second Amendment's not absolute. Blah, blah, blah. And then he basically said that if he caught me with a gun, he'd arrest me. And uh, I felt like kicking him in the nuts, but I didn't because he was a cop and he was carrying a gun and stuff, you know. They enforce whatever the law is, whether it's a good law or bad law, and they think that they can have all these restrictions. And, you know, like at my university and other universities I worked at, you can't even have a gun in your car. So, you know, if you're on your way to uh, the university, you can't have a gun in the car, even though you're. it's okay to have one in the car every place else on the way. So it effectively disarms you because you can't have a gun in the car if you go to the university three days, four days a week, whatever it is. Without giving away the ending, um, it appears that uh, the story in, in Justifiable Homicide doesn't actually come to an end. Is there a sequel in the works that follows in the footsteps of the heroes and villains in Justifiable Homicide? Uh, yes. The protagonist, Robert Page, is an accounting professor with some firearms and martial arts training. He's going to continue the quest for justice with some of his former CIA buddies who may or may not agree with him on things. And, um, yeah, it's there's an ending to the book, but it's not a real ending. It leaves the door open that Robert Page is going to walk through in future episodes. It would be interesting to see justifiable homicide on the big or even little screen. It, it really lends itself to, you know, to that type of thing. Uh, anything in the works in that area? Have you been approached at all? I haven't been approached yet. I have some irons in the fire. What is the timeline for the sequel to Justifiable Homicide? Oh, tough question. Uh, I do plan to get back to another volume. There's a lot of loose ends I'd like to tie up. Um, I suppose the sequel featuring Robert Page will be out in 12 months or less. Really enjoyed the book. I recommend it highly and Good luck with uh, all that stuff in the future. I look forward to it. I think it's uh, they're great subjects, and uh, and you treat them in a very compelling and readable way.